Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Thursday, September 26, 2024. The House Task Force on the Attempted Assassinations of Donald Trump holds its first hearing, with many lawmakers focusing their criticism on the U.S. Secret Service and not state and local law enforcement for not having a sufficient protection plan and overseeing confused communications. We'll hear some of the testimony and talk with Associated Press reporter Farnoosh Amiri. New York Mayor Eric Adams is indicted on federal charges of taking bribes and illegal campaign contributions from foreign sources, urges everyone to hold their judgment until he's had a chance to present his side in court. FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell gives an update at the White House on Hurricane Helene, which is growing in strength and due to hit Florida tonight and then move up into Georgia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is in Washington meeting with congressional leaders and then with President Joe Biden and with Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic presidential nominee. Donald Trump, former president and the Republican presidential nominee, says he'll meet President Zelensky on Friday. President Zelensky presenting his victory plan in the war with Russia. President Biden announcing pledges of nearly $8 billion more in aid for Ukraine. The House Task Force, charged with investigating the near assassination of Donald Trump in Butler, Pennsylvania, writes CNN, heard from local law enforcement and medical examiner over what happened on July 13th when the former president was shot and one rally goer was killed. During the hearing, local officers testified to the convoluted communication set up that day where multiple different groups of officers were on separate radios, all separate from the Secret Service's own channel. The hearing comes the day after a bipartisan committee in the Senate released a damning report highlighting key failures by the Secret Service that day, including the lack of decision-making and leadership structure. That was the article from CNN. We'll hear from the state and local law enforcement in just a moment. First, another witness, former Secret Service agent Patrick Sullivan, is questioned by Congressman Lou Correa, a Democrat from California, about how communications should work in these circumstances. You mentioned there was a, you know, one command center is generally the situation. Here he had two command centers that didn't talk to each other. He had someone in the roof spotted, 1609, call was made, suspect on roof with a possible weapon, 1800, 1811 local police officer spots crooks, jumps off the roof, injures himself. 32 seconds later, you have a shot goes off. Real time, you've been with the Secret Service, sir. You with, with President Reagan, I believe you said. And President Bush, yes, sir. Thank you for that good work. Um, what went wrong? Who's in charge? And, well, and I'm not trying to say focus on you, but rather we have former President Trump going back to Butler here in the next few days. You know, I'm not looking for people that are guilty here. I'm looking for solutions. What went wrong? How can we fix that moving forward? Well, what went wrong here is there was a, um, there was a breakdown. Uh, and I'll explain one more time, Mr. Carrera. The site agent reports to the lead agent. The lead agent is responsible. He or she is responsible for the entire advance pro- package. And then that's presented to the field office supervisor and the detail supervisor. Are we, are we being lax here because Secret Service is an elite group of Americans done an excellent job of protecting our presidents. And here today, you describe to me, you know, who's in charge, at least for the locals and Secret Service and not the campaign, but is there somebody there who, who has the authority to say, this doesn't look good, pull the candidate off the stage, this situation is beyond my control or it doesn't look good, cancel this thing, move to a safer ground. Is there somebody there that has the authority to tell all three elements, this is not good, let's move on? Yes, the side agent and the lead agent, before the protectee gets there, could call ahead and say, it's not safe, do not let the protectee arrive, absolutely. Patrick Sullivan, former Secret Service agent, questioned by Congressman Luke Correa, Democrat of California at today's hearing of the House Task Force on the Attempted Assassinations of Donald J. Trump. Congressman Mike Kelly, Republican from Pennsylvania, is a task force chair. Butler, Pennsylvania, is in his district. He asked witnesses from Pennsylvania law enforcement about whether they felt prepared to help provide security at that rally in July. The witnesses are 
Edward Lentz, Adams Township Police Department in Butler, a sergeant, and Butler County Emergency Services Unit Commander, Drew Blasco, Butler Township Police Department Patrolling Officer, and John Harold, Pennsylvania State Police Lieutenant. Commander Lenz, because <clears throat> you and I have had not just minutes, but hours together, and a couple of days we'll be going a deep, deep dive to what happened. Do you feel that the Secret Service adequately prepared you and your men for July 13th? I believe I can answer the, the tasks that they had given us, uh, which would be to provide two counter-assault teams, two sniper teams, and a quick reaction force. Uh, we were certainly prepared for the missions that they had given us. There were additional things, obviously, that uh, probably needed covered, uh, but they had never asked us to do that. They never tasked us with that. Uh, so, so given what they specifically asked us to do, we were certainly prepared to do that. Okay, so you did what they asked you to do. But looking back at it now, it's, the question is, did they, did they clearly identify what it is that they expected of you or what you could have been responsible for? Uh, Mr. Velasco, same question. Uh, so I took my direction from Commander Lenz, and of the of the things that we were asked to do from from my direction from Commander Lenz for the pre-planning stages for the sniper teams, um, I would I would feel that uh, I did what was requested of me from Commander Lenz. Okay, so hindsight's always twenty twenty. Looking back on that. Do you think you were adequately prepared for what it is that ultimately happened? There's always uh, things that you can, you think that you can do better, uh, but with the information that we had, um, I believe that we did the very best that we can, or we could. Lieutenant Harold, you feel the Secret Service adequately prepared you and your men for the event? The Secret Service, after meeting with them at the site and going through what they requested PSP to do, was primarily the security of the farm show inside the fence line. So adequate troopers, I had 30 troopers inside that fence line once the motorcade arrived, and I, I feel that with them being the lead and we were in a request assist um, function, we provided what they asked for and we secured the inner perimeter of the farm show grounds. Yeah, I, I think with local law enforcement, I think you did everything that you were tasked to do that day. But looking back and looking at the game films and say, you know what, there probably were other things we should have been clued in on. John Harold, Pennsylvania State Police Lieutenant, also testifying Drew Blasco, Butler Township, Pennsylvania. Police Department patrolling officer, and Edward Lentz, Adams Township Police Department in Butler County, Pennsylvania, Sergeant and Butler County Emergency Services Unit Commander. An Associated Press article begins, members of a bipartisan House task force investigating the Trump assassination attempts emphasized during their first hearing Thursday that the Secret Service, not local authorities, was responsible for the failures in planning and communications that led to a gunman being able to open fire on former President Donald Trump in Pennsylvania. Joining us now on the phone is one of the reporters on that article, Varnush Amiri, congressional reporter. Thanks so much for being with us. Is it fair to say that the local and state police witnesses that testified today suspected there could be security problems with the Secret Service plan, but they were not the ones in charge? Yes, there were several uh, instances of testimony from the local Pennsylvania, you know, whether it was Butler County or Pennsylvania State Police, where they indicated that there was you know, a number of risk factors that came with the open um, outdoor rally that weren't prepared for by Secret Service, the campaign, and even law enforcement weren't prepared for when they got there. And that those really, you know, alleviate, like created a, a even more risk to the former president, to the rally goers, in a way that if they had done advanced preparation for that environment, they could have avoided. So the conclusions, not necessarily they want to change how the structure between the Secret Service and local authorities ex exist, but just better communicate between the two. Yes, 
that's the, the really clear through line from both, you know, questioning from Democrats and Republicans. And, and the testimony that they received was that there was a huge uh, communication breakdown between local law enforcement who often work with Secret Service hand in hand when there are these big outdoor rally events in the town. You know, Secret Service relies on local police. Local police relies on Secret Service. But in this instance, there was a communication breakdown in that they were, you know, the right information was not going to the right individuals in the right amount of time, which allowed this gunman to get on to this slanted roof and to be able to take multiple shots at the former president. This was the first hearing of the task force. What did the committee leaders say about how this investigation is going to proceed? Yeah, so this this uh, first hearing focused on the role of local police and their relationship with law enforcement, what local police officers um, and lieutenants saw that day, what they believe went wrong. And the next, uh, you know, phase of the investigation and according to the chairman and the ranking member will be, you know, a zeroing in on Secret Service, how how they failed to respond in time, how they managed to miss the gunman when there were several, um, you know, indications that there was someone who was a suspect that was suspicious on the roof. And just overall looking at the agency as a whole to see what uh, you know, what could have been in place, what, what sort of systemic changes are needed to ensure that what happened on July 13th never happens again. We're talking with Farnoosh Amiri, Associated Press Congressional Reporter. What level of uh, bipartisanship did you sense during this hearing today? It was, I mean, you know, as someone who has been covering Congress uh, for several years and especially over this last, uh, you know, 18 months, which I think anyone can argue has been the most contentious and divided Congress, um, this was a really stunning show of bipartisanship. I mean, since day one, uh, you know, in the hours after the shooting, uh, the assassination attempt against the former president, Democrats and Republicans have been really uniform in how they believe that any investigation into this should go, any reform should go and it should be, you know, with both parties involved. Where it did devoid and derail from the bipartisanship is the second part of the panel where Democrats uniformly walked out because they were not given enough indication about the two other uh, Republican members who were going to be on the second panel and they felt that, you know, the majority had not informed them or given them enough time to prepare. But overall, I would say, as you know, my experience covering oversight investigations, this has has been uniquely bipartisan. There are a lot of other investigations going on into the assassination attempts, the Secret Service and the Senate. How do they all fit together? Yeah. So, you know, this is the, you know, this was the fourth hearing that Congress held on the assassination attempt in Butler. Obviously, in the last two weeks, there has been a second assassination attempt. And, you know, lawmakers from both sides of the Capitol are working to include that event and and possible reforms or any sort of uh, legislative response to that, into the work that they've already been doing for the past two months. But a lot of it, you know, I will, you know, say this as someone who's covered the previous hearings, there wasn't a lot of news that broke from this. You know, a lot of the, you know, the failures and the mishaps by Secret Service or by the campaign or anyone else who was involved has been pretty litigated publicly over the past few weeks. And um, it's going to be interesting to see if any of these task forces or committees on both in the House and the Senate are able to kind of break through some of the already public uh, information and, and be able to get to the crux of what happened on that day. For Nusha Miri, Associated Press Congressional Reporter, you can find her work at apnews.com and on X at Farnoosh Amiri. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reporting on today's hearing writes Congressman Mike Kelly, chairman, said the House task force is on track to release its full findings in December. He said the 13-member group had identified security failures on multiple fronts. Mr. Kelly said at the end of the day, I believe all this could have been prevented. C-SPAN covered this hearing, and you can find the video at our video library, cspan.org. From the New York Times, Mayor Eric Adams was defiant on Thursday in the face of five federal charges of bribery, fraud, and soliciting illegal foreign campaign donations, insisting he would stay in office and imploring New Yorkers to hear his defense. The indictment against him, which was unsealed on Thursday morning after a search of the mayor's official residence, followed an investigation that started in 2021. Prosecutors said the scheme had begun 
when he was a top elected official in Brooklyn and continued after he became mayor. That was the article from the New York Times. Mayor Adams held a news conference outside his official residence, Gracie Mansion. Who is your point person dealing with major city business as you deal with this? That's number one. And number two, is there any circumstance by which you would resign? No, no. Listen, I'm here. I was elected by the people of this city, over 700,000 strong. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is a city. This is a city that is extremely uh, resilient. This is a city uh, that have we have gone through some difficult and hard times, and we're going to continue uh, to move forward as a city. And that's what that's shown. I think the, the narrative here that's missing. Ten months, ten months, months ago, when my phones were removed, we have not gone backwards. We have not stood still. We showed how we operate during difficult times. And when you say who's the point person that's going to deal with business communities, who's going to deal with the business of running the city, the point person is Eric Adams. I'm the mayor of the city of New York. And I have a, a competent team, a competent team of deputy mayors, a company, competent team of people who are going to continue to lead forward. And we're excited about that. Okay, go ahead, Katie. What is, what's your, yeah, yeah, yeah. You say this is retaliation Listen, my listen, listen, my legal team, my legal team, uh, my, 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 thank you. Uh, my, my legal team, my legal team is going to peruse the entire di- indictment. We got it today um, when it was released. Uh, the the news media received information before we did, uh, as they have been receiving for the last uh, ten months. Uh, you know, uh, it appears as though uh, the goal is to try to try this case publicly and not in the criminal justice system that's in place. And so we, based on what I read, it's clear that if it's campaign violations, I know I don't violate the campaign. That's right. Uh, if it's foreign donors, I know I don't take money from foreign donors. And I verbalize that to the team, both in writing and both in communication. And we will continue to do that. And we look forward uh, for the legal team to handle this as I handle the, the, the city of New York and continue the success that we've witnessed in the last two years and nine months as the mayor of the city of New York. Mayor Eric Adams, a Democrat, holding a news conference outside Gracie Mansion, the official residence of the mayor in New York City, joined by supporters. He's the first New York City mayor to face criminal charges while in office. In Washington at the White House, the press secretary, Crean Jean-Pierre, was asked about the suggestion from Mayor Adams that he's being targeted for prosecution because of his criticism of the Biden administration's policies on migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. Mayor Eric Adams suggests that he's being targeted by the Biden administration over his criticism of the migrant crisis. Now, this is the kind of accusation that's similar to what we've heard from former President Donald Trump. So what is the president's reaction to that kind of language being used? from a Democrat. Uh, Look, we have been always very clear, the president was clear even when he was running in 2020 that he was going to make sure that DOJ is independent and the DOJ is handling this case independently. I'm not gonna go beyond that. And Adams was also at a reception last night with the president at the Met. Did they talk? I can confirm to you that uh, the president did not see uh, the mayor and they did not speak. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre, her news conference at the White House. Returning to New York City, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Damian Williams, made a statement at his office about the charges against Mayor Adams. Today we are announcing campaign finance, bribery, and conspiracy charges against Eric Adams, the mayor of New York City. As the indictment alleges, Mayor Adams engaged in a long-running conspiracy in which he solicited and knowingly accepted illegal campaign contributions from foreign donors and corporations. As we allege, Mayor Adams took these contributions even though he knew they were illegal. And even though he knew these contributions were attempts by a Turkish government official and Turkish businessmen to buy influence with him. We also allege that the mayor sought and accepted well over $100,000 in luxury travel benefits 
from some of the same foreign actors who arranged many of the illegal campaign contributions. These benefits included free international business class flights and opulent hotel rooms in foreign cities. The mayor had a duty to disclose these gifts on his annual public disclosure forms so that the public could see who was giving him what. But as we allege, year after year after year, he kept the public in the dark. He told the public he received no gifts, even though he was secretly being showered with them. We allege that Adams accepted these benefits knowing that they were given to him because of his position. And in exchange for some of those improper benefits, he intervened in the New York City Fire Department's inspection process for a building owned and operated by the Turkish government allowing it to open even though it had not passed the fire inspection. Damien Williams, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, at his office in New York City. Some reaction to the indictment from members of Congress from New York. Hakeem Jeffries is the Democratic leader, writing, The indictment of a sitting mayor is a serious and sober moment for New York City. Like every other New Yorker and American, Eric Adams is entitled to the presumption of innocence. That principle is central to the administration of justice in the United States of America. A jury of the mayor's peers will now evaluate the charges in the indictment and ultimately render a determination. In the meantime, I pray for the well-being of our great city. And from Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, a Republican of New York, this is the culmination of the cult of corruption rampant in the New York Democrat Party. From the former disgraced Governor Cuomo and his significant henchmen to the communist Chinese who have infiltrated Kathy Hochul, the least popular New York governor in history, to now Eric Adams. Of course, Eric Adams should resign. New York Democrats will pay the price for this corruption and incompetence in November, and Republicans will sweep this November. That was a statement from Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. This is Washington Today. On the race for president, former President Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee, has a rally on Friday in Michigan. And Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic presidential nominee, will be in Arizona at the U.S.-Mexico border. Donald Trump today made a statement at Trump Tower in New York City about the vice president's expected visit. For nearly four years, we have been living through the worst border crisis in the history of the world. There's never been anything like it which has brought untold suffering, misery, and death upon our land. The architect of this destruction is Kamala Harris. When you look at the four years that have taken place after being named Border Czar, Kamala Harris will be visiting the southern border that she has completely destroyed, from what I understand, tomorrow. Why would she go to the border now, playing right into the hand of her opponent? I mean, you take a look at this. Why would you do that? There can be no justification for what she's done. There's nobody saying, oh, gee, she's done a fabulous job. She's done the worst job probably in the history of any border, not just our border. She keeps talking about how she supposedly wants to fix the border. We would merely ask, why didn't she do it four years ago? It's a very simple question. I could say this. With everything she has, she talks about borders and taxes and all these different things. Her policies on tax, by the way, are terrible. But I can say it for everything. Why didn't she fix it almost four years ago? She's got no plans got no talent, got no ability to do it. I'm here today to present you with the facts and only the facts about how Comrade Kamala Harris willfully threw open our border, helping to virtually destroy our country. Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee and former president, making a statement at Trump Tower in New York City. Story from The Hill. The Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee announced Thursday that it's launching a multi-million dollar television advertising buy in Texas and Florida targeting vulnerable senators Ted Cruz, Republican of Texas, and Rick Scott, Republican of Florida. The announcement comes as a surprise as Democratic senators did not expect their campaign arm to sink resources into those two big and expensive media markets 
while they also had to defend endangered Democratic incumbents in Montana, Ohio, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. That was the article from The Hill. The DSCC chair, Senator Gary Peters, Democrat of Michigan, was interviewed today at the National Press Club in Washington. Hi, Senator Peters. Emily Wilkins with CNBC. Um, I wanted to dig into a little bit more about the decision to go ahead and invest in Florida and Texas. I mean, right now, I know you're saying that your internal polls show that Tester is up in Montana. Of course, there's a lot of public polling out there that shows that he's down. And it seems like more money into that race, into Ohio. I think we're just a little surprised with uh, the amount of offense that defense Democrats have to play. What led to the decision to invest in Florida and Texas? Was it more funding coming in that you didn't expect or just better polls that you didn't expect? Thanks. Well, um, uh, that's a multi-part question to answer as well as the, the ask because it's about kind of all of that stuff that we have to, to look at. So, uh, and as Diaz uh, chair and my team, you know, we have to make those kinds of assessments uh, real time, and we're following all the races very, very closely uh, with our polling. Uh, we do a lot of uh, part of what the DS does too, message development with focus groups, all the things that we'll do to kind of get a sense of what's going on in the state. <coughs> but certainly, I'm a, I'm a data guy. We're going to look at data and, and see where things are because I don't have unlimited amount of money, and you've got to you've got to be able to spend it uh, very wisely. Uh, I usually I have a kind of a quick saying for folks: uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna win your race, uh, I'm probably not gonna give you any money, and if you're gonna lose your race, I'm not gonna give you any money. But you're right in the middle, and you're on the edge. We're all in. We're gonna do everything we can to get you because the only metric that that I care about is that we win and we have the majority. And if we can expand the majority, let's expand the majority. That's that was the metric we did. And, and sometimes that's hard decisions. I had to make some hard decisions last cycle of races uh, where we had to move money around at the end and we went to places. Just a quick example, uh, you know, we saw Pennsylvania starting to slip away. We were really worried about Pennsylvania and we put a lot of revenue at the end. I said every penny I got coming in news going to Pennsylvania. That paid off. We won and we picked up uh, a seat. Those same kinds of thought processes going into effect uh, now. And so uh, we always thought there was potential in, in Florida, Texas for the candidate quality issues uh, that I that I mentioned. Uh, those states have changed. I mean, and if you think of Ted Cruz uh, in the last election uh, against uh, Beto, I mean, that was he only won by a couple points. Uh, it was that was a pretty close election. Uh, and Colin Allred is a is a great great candidate, and we're seeing that uh, people really like him. Uh, it's it's amazing the response he gets from folks, uh, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, and he's running against a, an unpopular incumbent in Texas. And actually, Ted Cruz's numbers are worse now than they were when he ran last time. Uh, in Florida, uh, uh, Rick Scott uh, has run uh, several statewide races, uh, and even uh, even when he has has a wind at his back with a strong Republican year, he's never won by more than just a hair over one point. So when you only win by one point or two points, and now we've got very strong candidates uh, in in both of those uh, races, and we've got the dynamics of especially with the abortion referendum in Florida. Uh, those are all very promising, but now we're seeing it in the data. The data is definitely showing some great momentum for us there. Uh, we expect there's a lot of upside, particularly when folks better get to know these uh, our candidates better. It's, uh, uh, it's pretty powerful uh, in terms uh, of the numbers. And so uh, we made the decision that we got to start investing. Uh, people around the country, I'm sure, will be investing uh, uh, to try to win uh, all of our seats, uh, but they'll be focused uh, on that. Uh, and and I, I'm, we're making this multi-million dollar investment now, and I'm very confident there's going to be more coming. So uh, I feel good about where we are. Senator Gary Peters, Democrat from Michigan, chair of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, with reporters at the National Press Club in Washington. Texas Tribune article quotes a Ted Cruz campaign spokesperson, the National Democrats coming in from their ivory towers in New York, D.C., and California tells Texans all they need to know, just like them. Colin Allred is nothing more than a radical leftist with a radical record who would destroy Texas and accelerate the decline of America. At ttnews.com, TT stands for Transportation Topics, there's this article, lawmakers said during a contentious congressional hearing September 26th, they are uneasy about the U.S. Postal Service's readiness for a crush of mail ballots for the November election because some of them feel burned by other Postal Service actions. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy 
sought to reassure a House Appropriations Subcommittee that the Postal Service is well positioned for an extraordinary effort to deliver mail ballots to election officials on time to be counted and that close to 100 percent will make it promptly. That was the article from ttnews.com. Here is the Postmaster General at today's hearing. As you know, for a variety of reasons, there is a heightened sensitivity and scrutiny across the entire vote-by-mail ecosystem. We recognize that the American public will become increasingly alarmed if there is ongoing dialogue that continues to question the reliability of the Postal Service in the upcoming elections. Let me be clear. The Postal Service is ready to successfully deliver the nation's mail-in ballots. We have a long track record of success, delivering election mail back to 1864. Even though during the global pandemic in 2020, we were sex, sex successful in delivering historic volume of mail-in ballots during a presidential election year, delivering 99.89% of the ballots from voters to election officials within seven days, our recommended common sense time frame for ballot return by mail. We will be even better prepared for 2024. Our network is designed to readily handle a surge in mail-in volume just like we do every election and holiday season. Even in 2020, the historically high number of ballots accounted for just 0.1% of the Postal Service's total mail volume that year. As in the past, in each general election year, we deploy what are referred to as extraordinary measures, enabling our dedicated people to expedite ballots through our system in the days immediately preceding Election Day when deadlines loom. These processes, procedures, and their schedules for activation are identified in my written testimony. Importantly, the extraordinary measures we undertake immediately preceding Election Day are designed to rescue ballots that are entered late into our system, likely too late to make the election deadline set by election officials. They represent a deviation from normal mail flow and processing, meaning they won't run through our plants and processing machines as mail normally would. We engage in these heroic efforts to beat the clock, and they are only used when the risks inherent from deviating from our standard processes are justified by the risk of a voter's ballot not meeting a state's election deadline. In those instances, we prioritize expeditious delivery. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy testifying before a House Appropriations Subcommittee. Cleveland Plain Dealer writes that after increasing the price of stamps six times in the last four years, the U.S. Postal Service will not raise prices again in January. The decision, a recommendation from Postmaster General Louis DeJoy to the U.S. Postal Service Board of Governors, means rates for a forever stamp needed to mail a first-class letter will remain at 73 cents. Washington Today continues in a moment. The House will be in order. This year, C-SPAN celebrates 45 years of covering Congress like no other. Since 1979, we've been your primary source for Capitol Hill, providing balanced, unfiltered coverage of government, taking you to where the policies debated and decided, all with the support of America's cable companies. C-SPAN, 45 years and counting, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app that's free and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Story from Reuters, officials issued dire warnings on Thursday about a strengthening Hurricane Helene pleading with Floridians in coastal areas along the storm's path to evacuate ahead of catastrophic winds and a deadly storm surge. Forecasters said Helene would reach major hurricane status before making landfall on Thursday evening, potentially as a Category 4 storm with sustained wind speeds of up to 156 miles per hour. Dangerous flooding and forceful winds were expected to extend into Georgia and the Carolinas. That was the article from Reuters. At the White House during the Daily News Conference, FEMA Director Deanne Criswell gave an update on federal efforts. I did just finish briefing President Biden um, on the impacts that we are expecting to see from Hurricane Helene. And as I told him, uh, we have been preparing for this storm for a number of days, and we began moving resources into Florida on Monday. 
I just want everybody to know that this is going to be a multi-state event with the potential for significant impacts from Florida all the way to Tennessee. And the president wants to make sure that everyone is paying attention to the potential life-threatening impacts that this storm may bring. And he has directed me to travel there tomorrow to assess the impacts. Uh, the entire state of Florida is under some type of warning right now, whether that's a hurricane warning or a tropical storm warning. Um, and we expect life-threatening flash flooding in the state's north as the storm continues to move north. And so I need everybody to pay attention to their local officials. They are going to have the best information on the specific risks where you are at. We're already seeing impacts in Florida, and the forecast indicates that we could see up to 20 feet of storm surge. So just think back two years ago to Hurricane Ian. The peak storm surge from that was 14 feet, and we saw the amount of destruction, and 150 people lost their lives, the majority of them from drowning. So please take this threat from storm surge seriously. Residents that are in these areas, they can still take action. They can take action now to move out of harm's way. And remember that you may only need to go 10 or 15 miles inland to get away from the threat of the storm surge itself, because water is the number one reason that we see people lose their lives in these storms. So please don't underestimate what the impacts could possibly be. So at the president's direction, um, we have over 1,100 personnel so far across the federal government supporting um, the preparedness efforts for this storm. We also have an additional 700 personnel from FEMA that are already in these states supporting other disasters that we can quickly pivot to support any of the response needs as needed. Some of the resources that we have already deployed include eight search and rescue teams across Florida and Georgia, as well as resources from the Coast Guard, the Department of Defense, to immediately support any life-saving um, operations as needed. Now, the Army Corps of Engineers has power restoration teams and debris specialists who are going to be able to help restore power and support debris removal operations as soon as it is safe to do so. We have health and medical task forces from Health and Human Services to evaluate the impacts to medical facilities. We have food, water, generators, and tarps that are deployed to staging locations across the region, and so they are easily accessible and movable post-storm. And the Red Cross is actively standing up shelters in areas um, that are expected to see and feel the impacts from Helene. Deanne Criswell is the director of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, in the White House briefing room. Governor Ron DeSantis, Republican of Florida, writing on his ex account. Hurricane Helene is going to make landfall this evening in the Big Bend, but dangerous conditions will be present throughout the rest of the state, even outside the forecast zone. To stay safe from hazards like debris, down power lines, and standing water, do not try to do any work in the dark tonight. State and local emergency management officials are ready to assist seniors and others in need of help clearing debris after the storm passes. And Governor Brian Kemp, Republican of Georgia, today activated the State Operations Center and authorized up to 500 National Guardsmen and asked FEMA for a pre-impact emergency declaration to deploy help. Wall Street today, the Dow up 260, Nasdaq up 108, S&P up 23. Story from the Hill, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky told a bipartisan group of senators Thursday that he could bring Russia to the negotiating table next year if the Biden administration speeds up shipments of weapons to Ukraine and greenlights missile strikes deeper into Russia. In a closed-door meeting that lasted about 90 minutes, Zelensky told the senators that he needs more F-16 fighter jets and long-range missiles with capability to strike more than 100 miles into Russia, promising that Russian President Vladimir Putin would negotiate a peace deal if his own country faces a greater military threat. That was from The Hill. President Zelensky, leaving Capitol Hill, then traveled to the White House to meet with President Biden in the Oval Office, discussing President Zelensky's victory plan and... President Biden announcing a military aid package for Ukraine worth $7.9 billion. Mr. President, welcome back to the White House. Welcome back to the Oval Office. Got to see each other yesterday. And you shared a preview of your plan to win this war. And that's exactly what uh, we're going to discuss today. Now, the Ukraine, how is Ukraine going to prevail in this conflict? And I see two key pieces. First, right now, we have to strengthen Ukraine's position on the battlefield. 
And that's why today I'm proud to announce a new $2.4 billion package of security assistance. I've also directed the Pentagon to allocate, to allocate all the remaining security assistance funding that has been appropriated to Ukraine, period, by the end of this, my term, which is January 20. And this will strengthen Ukraine's position in future negotiations. Second, uh, we look ahead to help Ukraine succeed in the long term. As you know better than anyone, we, as we said at the Washington Summit, we have to support Ukraine in its path to membership to both the EU and the NATO, and continue to make reforms to counter corruption and strengthen democracy, which you're working mightily on right now. We have to ensure Ukraine has sufficient capabilities, and I mean sufficient capabilities, to de defend against future Russian aggression. So I'm proud of the steps we've taken in our partnership on these fronts. Earlier this summer, we launched the Ukraine Compact with more than 20 nations committed to Ukraine's long-term security. And yesterday, with over 30 nations and the EU, we launched a joint declaration of support for Ukraine's recovery and reconstruction, some of it using Russian assets as well. And so uh, with both these actions, we make it clear we stand with Ukraine now and in the future. We've got a lot to discuss, so let me close with this. These two elements are critical to how this war ends. Let me be clear. Russia will not prevail in war. Russia will not prevail. Ukraine will prevail, and we'll continue to stand by you every step of the way. So thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, thank you for your strong support for the decision that are helping us protect Ukraine, Ukrainians, our whole. We deeply appreciate that Ukraine and America have stood side by side from the very first moments of this terrible Russian invasion. Your determination is incredibly important for us to prevail. Yesterday we had, as you said, we had a G7 plus meeting on Ukraine's reconstruction with more than 30 countries participating, and it was a truly helpful format. We must restore normal life, and we greatly value your leadership, Mr. President. We also have 26 bilateral security agreements with partners based on the G7 security declaration. We have a strong security agreement with the United States, and we are grateful for it and we will fully implement it. And it's very important that we share the same vision for Ukraine's security future in the EU and NATO. And Ukraine is doing the unprecedented number of reforms on this path. Today we have a new support package, $7.9 billion. This will be a great help and I raised with President Biden the plan of victory. Today we are preparing to discuss the details to strengthen the plan, coordinate our positions, views, and approaches. Our teams will work together to ensure the implementation of our future steps. And today in the morning, I've met with both Senate and the House, and uh, thank you for the unwavering bipartisan support, and to all American people together, we have to win, and we will win. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. In the White House Oval Office, the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and President Joe Biden. Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic presidential nominee, met separately with President Zelensky in the Vice President's ceremonial office in the Eisenhower Executive Office building next to the White House. In Switzerland in June, along with 90 other nations at the, U at the Ukraine Peace Conference, I told you that the United States shares your vision for the end of this war, an end based on the will of the people of Ukraine and the UN Charter, and that we must work with the international community to secure a just and lasting peace. And I told world leaders there, nothing about the end of this war can be decided without Ukraine. However, in candor, I share with you, Mr. President, there are some in my country who would instead force Ukraine to give up large parts of its sovereign territory, who would demand that Ukraine accept neutrality and would require Ukraine to forego security relationships 
with other nations. These proposals are the same of those of Putin. And let us be clear, they are not proposals for peace. Instead, they are proposals for surrender, which is dangerous and unacceptable. So President Zelensky, I look forward to our discussion today, and I will continue to work with you to ensure Ukraine prevails in this conflict and remains a free, democratic, and independent nation. Welcome back again. Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic presidential nominee, meeting with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building next to the White House. Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee, it was announced earlier, would not be meeting with President Zelensky today. Donald Trump at a news conference at Trump Tower in New York City today announcing he'll be meeting with President Zelensky in New York tomorrow morning. But ABC News writes that former President Donald Trump on Wednesday lashed out at President Zelensky and painted a picture of an absolutely obliterated Ukraine as the foreign leader is in the U.S. to present what he calls his victory plan to 2024 candidates and President Joe Biden. At a campaign event in North Carolina, Trump went after Zelensky for making little nasty aspersions toward him. Article continues, while Trump didn't elaborate on what the comments were, Zelensky was recently critical of Trump and his running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, in an interview with The New Yorker. Zelensky expressed doubt Trump knew how to end the Russia-Ukraine war despite Trump's assertions without detail or specifics, that the war never would have happened if he were president, and he would end it on the first day of his new administration. That was from ABC News. Here's Donald Trump on Wednesday in North Carolina. Many, many Russian soldiers are dead. A deal could have been made. There wouldn't have been one person that died, and there wouldn't have been one golden tower laying shattered on its side. A deal could have been made if we had a competent president instead of a president that egged it all on. And Biden and Kamala allowed this to happen by feeding Zelensky money and munitions like no country has ever seen before. Every time he came to our country, he'd walk away with $60 billion. He's probably the greatest salesman on earth. But now Ukraine is running out of soldiers. Donald Trump in North Carolina on Wednesday. Again, he announced today at a news conference in New York City he will meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky Friday morning in New York. From NBC News, in a brief statement on the airport tarmac as he arrived in New York for the U.N. General Assembly, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu insisted that his government will not stop its fight against Hezbollah in Lebanon. Netanyahu said in Hebrew, My policy, our policy is clear. We continue to hit Hezbollah with all our might. We will not stop until we achieve all our goals. First of all, the safe return of the residents of the north to their homes. This is the policy, and no one will mistake it. Article goes on, his statement struck a defiant tone against efforts by U.S. and French officials to push Israel and Hezbollah to agree to a 21-day ceasefire in order to engage in long-term diplomatic discussions. The prime minister will be speaking to the U.N. General Assembly on Friday. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin today was asked about the prime minister's rejection of the ceasefire with Hezbollah. Austin was at a news conference in London, along with the defense ministers of Great Britain and Australia. Uh, Haley Britsky, CNN. Thank you so much. Uh, Secretary Austin, you've spoken with your Israeli counterpart multiple times in the last week. Given Prime Minister Netanyahu's comments today, do you have confidence that Israeli leadership is listening to the U.S. when it comes to this conflict with Hezbollah? Uh, thanks, Haley. Um, you heard me say a couple of seconds ago that uh, a full-scale war between uh, LH and, uh, and Israel could be devastating for, for both, uh, both parties. And it could lead to a, a larger uh, conflict uh, throughout the region. So um, that's not in the best interest of, of, of anyone. And the best way forward is, uh, is to pursue a ceasefire that will enable diplomacy to take place. Again, I know that our diplomats continue to engage uh, each other on this issue, 
Uh, I am confident that they'll continue to, to, to find a way to, uh, uh, to do just that, uh, you know, get to a point where we can, uh, we can see a ceasefire and still uh, work towards a, a diplomatic solution. Uh, but this is, we recognize that there's hard work to be done. We are committed to doing that work. Uh, and yes, I am optimistic that, uh, that the right things will happen. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at a news conference in London. Article from AP, nearly 700 people have been killed in Lebanon this week, according to Lebanon's health ministry, as Israel dramatically escalated strikes, saying it, w- it is targeting Hezbollah's military capacities. The health ministry said two people were killed and 15 were wounded after an Israeli airstrike hit an apartment building in a southern suburb of Beirut. The Israeli Defense Force said the strike killed a Hezbollah drone commander. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter word for word and get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox each day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. 